Let me, um, I want to read part of Colossians 3 today. And uh, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. And um, he says this, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, in God. I want you to think about that. Let's pause for a minute. Think, think about that. Paul's challenge is, look up. Look up to God. Look, look first up to God, and that you need to set your mind on the things of God. We're, we, 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 we're, we struggle with that at times because it, it's hard sometimes to see. And that's no different than it was even in the first century. Gizadon says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Again, I want to pause for a second. And in my Bible, I've, uh, I, this is a Bible I started using four or five years ago. And, and as I, each time I read through it, I have highlighters and I highlight different verses. And in this particular chapter, there's um, three different colors. Uh, as I'm reading through, I, those things I want to pop out at me, I use a yellow highlighter for. Those are things that I want to look at closely, and, and they, they, they would be things like verse 5 that says, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. But then in the next, ver the next two verses, verses 6 and 7, I, I, I have in a, an orange color, kind of a, a caution that says, here's what happens. And these are the, this is what happens when we don't do what God calls us to do. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come on the sons of disobedience. I think that's something that, that we've lost, is the idea that the wrath of God can rest upon us too. The, you know, the, the story is you read through the Old Testament. It, it, it's pretty easy to see, isn't it? You read through and, 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 and God becomes unhappy. I mean, there's probably no greater story of God's unhappiness than the flood. The people, the, the people become, and it says, God looked out and said, what have I done? These people are so disobedient, and he could have wiped out, you know, it's, a, it's a story of wrath. Well, that story kind of repeats itself over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And, and Jesus came... To, to, to give us a way around the wrath of God. That he, he, he was willing to take on our sin. But it's still there. It's still our choice on how we're going to live. Who's, who are we going to listen to? And then he says, but now you also... Put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self and the evil practices. We're new in Christ. Now, sometimes we, we, we forget that in that first century how different 
becoming a Christian was than, than any other religion in the world. And the truth is, that's still true today. When we begin to follow Jesus, it is, it is different than any other religion in the world. Now, oftentimes, I don't think we really think about that, but there is no other re religion on, on earth that claims a risen Lord. One that's overcome death, that suffered and died for our sin. And Paul says, be worthy of that. Be worthy of that. Put on the new self who is being renewed in the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We are all created in the image of God. We're, we're created in the image of God so that, so that we can reflect God to the world. And, and Jesus came to be the perfect reflection. The perfect reflection of God. You know, did, um, I, I remember the first Sunday I ever preached as a pastor, uh, I, I talked about being angry with God at one point in my life. And um, somebody told the matriarch of the church, I'm not coming back. I don't want to listen to any pastor that's ever been mad at God. And I thought, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty it, it's, it's not right to be mad. Well, I don't know, have you ever been mad at God? Have you ever been in one of those situations where it, you just felt left down by God? I think most of us have been there at one time or another. And, but I went out and I started looking at, at Jesus and said, you know, did, did, we have this really peaceful image of Jesus. But Jesus did two things, if you read through the Gospels carefully, that we don't often see Jesus as doing. One is being angry. The easiest passage to see that is when he goes into the temple. And by the way, it's kind of interesting that that, that story's told in, in uh, the Gospels. And sometimes it's early in Jesus' ministry. And then there's that Holy Week passage where Jesus comes in. And what's he do? He, he drives the, the, the money changers, the people that are selling inside the temple courts, out of the temple. And, and in one passage it says he took a whip to do it. Now I'm guessing that when he did that he didn't take that whip and say now boys you're being bad. I think he drove them out. Get out. But the other thing that we often don't see Jesus doing is challenging people to rethink the way they live. And he did that oftentimes by asking questions. He asked them questions about the way they were living and the way they were treating other people. And I think that's what Paul is talking about here when he's challenging the early church. And that early church we often have to remember was very unique in the world. They were, they were bringing a message of freedom. And it's interesting, some of the things we've talked about, some of the things that Paul taught were, were not popular with some folks because, or are not popular today because they seem to be restrictive, but they were in reality freeing to the first century church. So in this passage, Paul goes on to say, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, set apart, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you also should forgive. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Put on love. Put on what? And, and, and 
what I find in Jesus is, is a, the image of somebody who loved people enough to challenge them, to call them to a different way of life, but let the choice up to them. You know, I, I often think that, that that wrath of God that we often see in the Old Testament, you know, there's not only the flood story, but there, there's a number of other stories. I mean, if you, you, you go back to the, the tower, or tower of Babel, you, you know, it's one of, those, one of those stories. Up until then, everybody spoke the same language, and, and they, they begin to build this tower, and, and it, God says, let's get down and confuse them. Let's go down and, 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 and confuse them. And what, what's he do? They scatter around the world. There's those, there's those stories where, where the earth opens up and swallows not only the sinner, but their whole family. And in reality, when we think about it, how much of sin swallows not just us, but our whole family? You know, oftentimes we say, well, it's my choice. I can do what I want to do. It only affects me. But the reality is, there is very little we do in life that only affects us. If for no other reason, the pain of sin is lived by those that love us. See, Paul was challenging the church to live like Jesus. To live, to live and to put on love. To do those things. To have a heart of compassion. You know, you, you've, you've heard me say that, uh, and, and we talked about it not just long ago, that, that the golden rule, treat others as if... You, as you would want them to treat you. And, you know, I, I add on the line to the end of that. Treat others as you would have them treat you if you were in their place. And I think, I think that's, that's the image that, that Jesus wanted us to have. That we would put ourselves in the shoes of people that are experiencing life. That, that might be struggling with their own sins. Just like you and I are. None of us are perfect. All of us. Paul says all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And, and so we have, to, we have to decide what we're going to do with that. Are we going to put on love? Are we going to show compassion and kindness? Humility. Now, I, Chuck Swindoll, in one of his commentaries, does a really interesting description of what being humble or showing humility is that, that, that touched my life. Uh, if you're not familiar with Chuck Swindoll, he's, a, he's an old-time Bible teacher uh, that I've been listening to and reading his work for more than 30 years. And, and the reason that I've enjoyed him so much, and I, he's written a series of commentaries I use, is, is that he breaks down all of the tough stuff to hear and makes it in, in a way that we can understand it. But Chuck Swindoll was talking one, in one of his books about being humble, and he said, too often when we think of being humble or acting towards others with humility, that we think of it as putting ourselves down. That we think of it as thinking less of ourselves than we, than, than, than we do. He says, but that's really not a good translation in the word, that, that it is seeing ourselves as God sees us, whether that's good or bad. And so when I read this passage this week, put on humility. See yourself as God sees you. When, and, and how does God see us? God sees us on how we treat others. If we're going to challenge somebody on the way they live, 
Are we challenging them to live more like Jesus or more like us? I want you to think about that for a second. When we're not happy with somebody and we want them to live differently, are we challenging them to look more like Jesus or are we challenging them to look more like us? Now I can tell you, it's okay to look like you in every way that you look like Jesus. But not if it's not, then maybe it's time we reassess how we're challenging people to look at ourselves as God sees us. And then to treat them with gentleness and patience. It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Do you, do, you, do, you ever, do you ever interact with somebody you'd like to take and slap up the side of the head? You know, some of you'd like to do that with me some days, right? I, I, it's okay. But, but see, what, what, why, why, do we, why do we respond, whether with great anger or great joy, to something somebody says? One of the things I've discovered is that that's usually in response to something we really either like because it's we see ourselves in it and say, yeah, that's me. I like that. Or we see our we see somebody that we don't like and we say, no, I, I don't like what you're saying. You see, my job as a pastor, as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, is not to change anybody else. That's never my job. My job is never to try to change those folks that serve with me in the churches I serve. That's not my job, that's God's job. But it is my job to ask ourselves the question repeatedly, how do we look like Jesus? How do we reflect Jesus to the world? How do we put on love? And then Paul goes on and says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Now, he's writing to the church, right? But the peace of Christ. In, in, in my Bible, this is a green passage. This says, man, this is, this, is the, this is the way to do it. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body. We as the church are called to be one body in the reflection of Jesus. In unity. Now that doesn't mean that we're all alike. We will have to look at one of those passages too in, in Corinthians where, where Paul challenges the early church and says, you're not all called to be the same. Some are called to be uh, teachers and some apostles. Some are called to be givers. And some are called to prayer. But you're all called to be a part of the body of Christ that we call the church and be thankful. Be thankful for one another. Um, I'm oftentimes more thankful for those that are different than me than those that are the same as me. We, what do we tend to do? We tend to like to be with people that are like us, don't we? But, but the reality is that, I, you know, I, and I know I'm weird, but I love to be with people that are different than me because it challenges me to consider why I am who I am. And that includes in the life of the church. Because one of the things I've learned, especially over the last 25 years as a pastor, is that the people that are gathered around me have different skills that God has placed there for a season to be the church. And the question is, are we be willing to be obedient to his word? 
He goes on in 16 to say the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ ritually dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now I have to tell you, this morning as I was reading that passage one more time, I, I, I underlined the word singing with thankfulness in your hearts. And I underlined in your hearts because as we gather for worship, especially in the sanctuary, um, for a season, it's not safe to sing out. And so, you know, if we're in the sanctuary, we're not going to sing. If you're in your car, you can sing. If you are got lots of distance outside, you can sing. But otherwise, I want you to sing in your heart. That's the only way you'll experience singing with me. At least, I love to sing, but I, I can't carry a tune. So I sing in my heart, though. I'm a, I'm a professional soloist in my heart. But I, you, 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 you wouldn't enjoy it. See, I think God wants us to understand that worship is not a public performance. We don't gather in the sanctuary or the parking lot to perform for God. We gather to worship to turn our attention to God. To let the word of Jesus richly dwell within us. See, Jesus' purpose of coming was to teach us how to live and to interact with others every day. How to, how to treat the most important people and how to treat even the least of these. Let it dwell within you with wisdom teaching. Uh, you know, I, I love that little phrase. It's uh, wisdom teaching. What's that mean? That means we're teaching from experience. You know, if there's anything I, I've learned is that age has nothing to do with wisdom. When I when I first joined the fire department, they sent me to they sent me to truck driving school to learn how to drive all the trucks. And so I'm setting going to class first day. We're introducing ourselves, and um, the the instructor looked around the room after everybody introduced themselves. He says, "Now now I, I know some of you are here for a refresher. You young guys, look around. These gray haired guys can help you out." And I and I laughed and I said. Don't be deceived by my age. I've never driven a truck in my life. See, it's, it, it wasn't about my age. It was about my experience. Well, life in the church is the same way. We have people, and, and unfortunately, we have people that have lived in the church inside the buildings for years that have never applied the Word of God to their life. A number of years ago, one, a lady came up to me after Bible study one night and said to me, I don't understand how I've been a part of this church for 41 years and have learned more about the Bible in the last six months. And I don't know how that happens either. But I do know that when we let the Word of God dwell in our hearts, when it becomes the way we teach, treat those we love and even those we don't, we have much to come and worship and give praise to God for. And Paul goes on and says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And then he goes through some of those those, those passages that that it depends on where you are in life that you that he, that he, that we like to jump over. Wives, be subject to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. 
How many of us want to jump over those verses? Or, or if we're our children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for it is well-pleasing to the Lord. You know, if you're a child, you don't like to hear that passage, do you? But how many of us quote that passage to our kids? But how many quote the next verse? Father, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. And slaves and so on. In other words, take this which I'm challenging you with and apply it to your daily life. This isn't about what you do here. This is about what you do when you're interacting with others. And he says that in verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. And I find that necessary for us, whether we're doing work in the church or whether we're doing work somewhere else. How do you, how do, you do it? Do you do it to the best of your ability so that you can take and present it to God as an offering? I, I want to challenge you to think about that. Whatever you're doing, how well do you do it? <laughs> And how do you decide how well you're going to do it? Do you do it so that when you're done, you could take that and offer it to God as an offering to God? Look, God, look what I've done for you. See, I want to suggest that's why we ought to come to worship. Why we ought to gather in our cars, in the parking lot, or in the sanctuary is that we ought to come to present our week to God. Here, God, you gave me this week. You gave me the gift of life this week, and look what I did with it. I'm so thankful that you gave me this gift. But sometimes we might have to come to worship with humble hearts and say, Lord, you gave me this week, and I wasted it. You gave me this week. I not only wasted it, I misused it. Forgive me, Lord. And that is the secret of Jesus. Those are the magic words. Lord, forgive me. But don't stop there. See, that's where Jesus really challenge the world. Don't just come and say, I was wrong, Lord. I made a mistake. I didn't do this right. It's not repentance unless we turn away from it. So what have you done with your week? What have you done? He says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the war reward of inheritance is the Lord Jesus Christ who you serve. When we take on the image of Jesus, when we take on the title of Christian, it does not make us a, a little Jesus. It does not make us a Christian any more than taking on any other title in the world makes it true unless we're willing to live it out. That's really a challenge for us. Are we willing to compare ourselves to Jesus each and every day? You know what I think most of us would find? I think most of us will find we have an awful lot to come and sing praises of God to because we've done it really, really well. But what do people call our attention to? They call our attention to their failures, don't they? And see, I think that's, that's one of the things I learned from Chuck Swindoll is, is Chuck said, be really careful because there's lots of people out there that'll point out every mistake you make. They're, those people are out there. 
but it's important that whether somebody's giving you praise or criticism, that you say, how did God see that? And then make it right with God. And give thanks. And sometimes we have to give thanks for that friend that came and said, you know, this really isn't the way to live. This is a mistake. And sometimes we get to praise God because somebody said, wow, that was really good. So I want to challenge us to walk out of here today knowing that we are loved. And when we pull out of the parking lot, that we're going out into the world to love others because we were loved first. That we're going to look and, and, and what we're going to do, starting with ourselves, is saying, how does God see them? How does God see me? How does God see me in this situation? But just as importantly, we need to look at whoever it is we're dealing with and say, how does God see them? May God touch each of our lives in dramatic and powerful ways. And might each of us uplift and show love to those we meet. Amen.